Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. All right, guys, finally, I'm getting to this video. A lot of you have been wanting me to do this video about prints. What happened to prints? Well, I'm going to start in the beginning. So prints started in 1970 by a guy named Robert H. McClure. Um, it, it was a company that only sold ball machines. So Prince only sold ball machines. You know, those ones that, like my slinger, right? It shot balls at you so you can play with yourself, right? Without the other person, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's all they did in their first business venture. Now, after doing that for a little while, a guy by the name of Howard Head, yes, that Howard Head, of Head Racket Sports, of Head, of the Head Company, this Head, Howard Head, all right? So Howard Head had just retired from a successful run uh, of skis and boots and whatever else you needed for snow sports. And he was about 60 years old. He decided that, hey, I'm gonna play tennis now, right? And he and Bob, I believe, were friends. And so he started playing the sport. He took a wooden racket and decided that, oh, I'm 60 years old and I'll start playing tennis. Well, he figured out that he wasn't very good in it and thought that, oh, maybe I can develop something that will help me improve the game in the game faster, right? So he started tinkering and because he had all the materials from making skis uh, at his disposal, he decided to make a racket, right? That was the dawn of the first oversized aluminum racket. So this helped him improve immensely and quickly. So not only was it not wood, it was aluminum, but oversized. So he invented the oversized racket. The first edition of this racket was 100 square inches. A wooden racket is what, 70 to 80 square inches max. So of course, this is gonna be easier to play with. It's also a lot lighter, right? It's aluminum, it's not solid wood. So he started playing a lot better. He actually took over the company from Robert McClure and became head of prints. So with the dawn of this racket became the dawn of new players. Like people were inspired to play. It was easier for the club level players to play well um, hit the ball harder, you know, basically make the game more fun, right? So this was the age of oversize. This was the dawn of oversize, the birth of the oversize. Now, so Robert McClure stepped down, went on to do his own thing, retired. Uh, so now Howard Head's in charge of Prince. So Head's in charge of Prince, right? Uh, and he developed this racket, the Prince Pro. Pam Shriver used this in 1976. She got to the semifinals and beat Martina Navratilova in the semis in 1976 uh, with this, but eventually lost to Chris Everett at the U.S. Open. So that pretty much uh, put a name and a face to Prince. That was the dawn of Prince's brand being mainstream on the pro level. Success started to follow them, right? Everybody knew Prince, everybody wanted a Prince. Um, I, when I was growing up, right, I wanted one of these. And then when these came out, Prince Graphites, I wanted one of these too. I think a lot of it actually has to do with the name, 
prince, right? It's it's not king, but it's prince. You know, it's kind of cool. Like I have a prince racket, whereas you know Wilson kind of had an older mystique, right? Wilson, kind of older person, older crowd. Can you say? And Prince was like cool, a la modern day Babylon, right? So everybody wanted Prince. But let me tell you what Prince actually stood for. It doesn't stood for, it does not stand for royalty. There is no king above that Prince. Um, Prince's address is one board in town in New Jersey, and the city is called Princeton. So they called it Prince because of Princeton, New Jersey. So no royalty there, guys. But growing up, you know, in that time, the late 70s, the 80s, right? Who didn't want a Prince Graphite Oversize, right? We had Andre playing with it. We had Michael Chang playing with it. I mean, pretty much all the up and comers at Boletari played with a Prince Graphite Oversize. It was the racket to get. Like everybody wanted this including me right they even um spawned off other rackets like the, the prince spectrum which was white and super cool and then they had that super expensive prince boron the stiffest racket ever made back then and they even made that racket in 135 square inches they even made it bigger right so it was a stiff racket made out of boron Plus, they made it 135 square inches, so bigger and badder and stiffer than anything else out there. So they pretty much made game improvement to your game, right? They made the game a lot easier. As we progressed later on in the Prince timeline, uh, remember Jennifer Capriotti and the CTS series? Lightning Strikes, right? With the CTS Lightning. We had the Approach, we had the Thunderstick, um, great lines they they are now bigger wider with the wide bodies more powerful um, pretty much a great combination of everything so they were you know again the the company to buy the company to have um, they were like the company they're like Babylon superstar in in the racket world who can forget do you remember those Thunder Light, the Thunder, the Thunder series, which was large head, ultra light, and longer, like the Thunder Strike, the Thunder Light, um, and everything was called Thunder, and uh, that was a one of their major bestsellers too. I still string those today. People still bring me those. And who can forget Michael Chang's uh, version of this, the Michael Chang Signature Edition which was this racket, the Prince Graphite Oversize, with a, ha with a whole inch longer. Remember the long racket revolution? Well, even Michael Chang got into it. So Michael Chang, limited edition long racket, was one inch longer. Or it was Michael Chang's signature edition, one inch longer. I even owned that, it was a cool blue. Remember that? Um, moving on, we had, remember Patrick Rafter? Right, I know a lot of people forgot Patrick, but um, he won some slams with Prince, right? And then came um, Maria. Maria kept him at the top, right? I know that, that freaking stupid shark didn't do very well, but the one that she got onto right after that, that 03 white, remember that Prince 03 white? All you stringers did, because all you jacked them up at least 10 times like me. Right, so the Prince 03 White was the number one racket. Um, I want to say for two, three years, right? But that was a good playing racket, right? The whole series was actually good. The 03 Black, you had the 03 Red, you had the 03 Blue. So you're pretty much covering all, you know, the spectrum of players. You even had a 03 Gold and a Platinum for people who wanted more power and even a bigger head than like the blue or the red. So I want to say they owned four to six, probably six of the top, no four, four of the top 10 spots um, about 15 years ago. So they were on top of the world. 
Um, even after that, they had the top shoe with the T22 um, and the top strings with the Prince Synthetic Gut. So who didn't use that, right? They were on top of the world, right? But what happened to them? So at that time, I want to say in 2000, five years before um, Prince hit, was still at the top in the year 2000, this racket came along, Babolat Pure Drive. All right, I'm sure, I'm sure Prince was like, eh, they're not gonna survive a year because that's what I said in 2000. I'm like, you make great strings, Babolat, but that's all you do. You, nobody, nobody comes into the racket world and dominates, right? That's what we all thought, including myself. We all said, eh, you know, they're not gonna make it past a year or two. Uh, but little did they know, they did a great job of grassroots marketing. They pretty much gave the stuff away the first few years to colleges, to juniors. Um, Andy put them on the map, Andy Roddick, right? So that is what you know that basically started spurring on the brand right it literally took them five years five years to 2005 to put their brand on tennis carlos moya won the french with this as their first grand slam winner andy roddick 2003 last american won with a babylon so they were starting to get a little bit of a foothold in there, but it only took them, I wanna say six short years, six short years to jump from nowhere to be found to having the number one, number two racket in the nation with this pure drive. What, so what happened to Prince then? So this is my perspective of what happened to Prince. So you can take it with a grain of salt if you want. Um, from my perspective, I want to say that they pissed off a lot of stringers. Um, I mean, like I always kid that nobody I know who strings rackets didn't jack one up, probably didn't jack 10 up. So we kind of all got tired of stringing them because they were not easy. It's like you needed a roadmap to do it. Um, I mean, after you do like 10 or 20, then you kind of figure out how to do it correctly. But there were little things about the racket that basically made it difficult. Like the holes being too tight, you had to bore out a hole. Um, you, you were, most people were going the wrong way on the mains. You, you guys know what I mean. It looks like it goes one way, but it actually goes the other. Uh, you finish stringing the mains, uh, doing it one piece, and it's saying that you can't do it that way and you have to cut it and do it two pieces. So I feel like all that basically was, start of the, was the start of the end. So here's the key, right? The stringers are who sells your rackets. If the stringers don't wanna string your rackets, right? They're probably not going to sell your rackets. So it took a while, but um, the O3s were great. We didn't want to string your rackets. Okay. So you finally screwed up and did the XO3s. XO3, meaning exoskeleton. What Prince did was they put a skeleton over and around the grommets, right? To hold, to, to, it was interesting. That basically put the strings on the exoskeleton instead of the racket itself as a different piece. When they did that, when they did that, it muted out the racket. So you took away a lot of the feel. Um, that was a horrible mistake by them. And they pretty much ran with it. And I wanna say that was 2008, uh, 2007, right in there. Uh, they, they decided just to run with it. 
I, I remember when I got my first batch of those, that exoskeleton was coming off. Like literally this piece fell off. And I'm like, what is going on? So I actually had to tape this bottom piece on. Um, and also the exoskeleton cracks because it was pretty brittle. But the proof in the pudding in which at least I celebrated it was when I demoed those out, people hated it. I was like, oh, people like the O3s. Um, and then now you hate this racket, the XO3, you hate it. I was like, uh oh, what's going on here? So the more I demoed it out, the more people hated it. I was like, uh oh, they're in big trouble now. They don't have a racket, right? So the racket of choice turned out to be the XO3 Black at that point. And that was their best selling racket. But when you went down from the white, which is like a pure drive to a black, you go down in power, right? So it doesn't cover all the bases anymore. So the black, I wanna say was a top 10 racket, but they were definitely losing market share. People were not on board anymore. Uh, therefore, it was actually a fast, fast slide. I mean, I wanna say by 2007, eight, Babylon took over the number one spot. Again, nobody anticipated that, uh, but Babylon surpassed Wilson, surpassed Prince, surpassed Head to be number one. And then Prince became pretty much two, three, four, and then now nowhere to be found. I also feel that there was a lot of stubbornness in the corporate offices of Prince, right? They kind of had a Lehman Brothers mentality that we're too big to fail. Well, I'm sorry guys, you failed. Um, they finally filed for bankruptcy in 2012 and they were bought by an equity firm and which owns them today. They actually, at least in America, have uh, pawned off or basically sold the rights to Tennis Warehouse to sell to the American market. Um, as I said in my other video, why don't I carry prints? Well, I mean, who's gonna carry prints if you're run by Tennis Warehouse or if you're selling it through Tennis Warehouse? I mean, it makes total sense. I totally get it. You know, you need one of the larger distributors, if not the largest distributors to sell your products. And hey, I would do that too. Tennis Warehouse is a great place. They will move product for you. So choosing them was probably the best decision they made coming out of bankruptcy. Um, but you won't see the Prince brand in you know, a pro shop like this. Um, you may see it in a Dix, uh, Big Five, uh, Costco possibly, um, just to kind of get product out there to larger distributors. But I mean, we, you know, nobody small is going to really want to support, you know, Tennis Warehouse, right? Even if Prince makes good products, it's, it doesn't make sense for us to support Amp. Like, do we want to support Amazon? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if it's a win-win situation, maybe, but it hasn't been presented to, to the guys like me yet. So ultimately, um, I mean, Prince went from number one, right? The best brand of rackets in tennis to kind of like nowhere to be found. And I feel like it was a, a bunch of mistakes along the way that, uh, you know, kind of kind of screwed them up, right? I mean, I, I think that, you know, I always tell the companies this, make sure you consider the stringer because the stringer is the one that's ultimately gonna be handling the racket. If you make it hard for them, you're probably not gonna sell that many rackets. And I think that was, you know, one of the key factors that they're not around in large markets today. I mean, I wanna say, if you think about it this way, Tennis Warehouse, I know you guys race on stringing with the 90 version of this, which is a 14 by 16, 14 mains by 16 crosses. 
I've seen some of those guys do it in seven to eight minutes. I get it, right? You go from the easiest racket to one of the hardest rackets to string. What's going to happen? You probably ain't going to be selling a lot of these rackets. So Prince, with the storied up and coming brand starting with this racket, um, changing and revolutionizing the tennis world to an epic demise uh, at the end. Uh, that is the story of Prince. Thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis.